Welcome, everyone. It's the Making Dad Summit, and Sarah and I are so excited to be here talking about the truth about testosterone. Welcome, Sarah, and welcome, Doctor, and here's Sarah to uh, um, tell us everything that we're going to speak about today. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for um, starting us off, Kristen, and I'm so uh, happy to introduce Dr. Worthman. He's um, becoming a, a really close friend and um, just a wonderful guy. He's the he's a, a surgeon to the stars down in, in Hollywood, and his clinic is the Center for Male Reproductive Medicine and Vasectomy Reversal. Did I get that right? You got it right. Awesome. It's such a, it's a long name, but it, uh, it's just he's he's got an incredible practice down there, um, really helping lots of men on their journey to fatherhood. And he's such an approachable, um, wonderful guy. He's so easy going to talk to and um, learn stuff from. So I always love the opportunity to interview him on on these really important subjects. So welcome, Dr. Worthman. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction, and may I say ditto. <laughs> I always learn something from talking to you, and I, uh, I love talking to you. Uh, we, we don't talk enough, unfortunately. Well, yeah, we both that's have babies, true. and that takes up so much time. <laughs> it really does. It really does. Um, so today, um, we're really we're really supporting men on their journey to fatherhood. It's it's so hard uh, for some men, as we're getting towards Father's Day, and just thinking about. Um, kind of what it's, you know, trying to become a dad and um, thinking about their own health and and uh, their own bodies and starting to l- learn things about their bodies. Um, so I, I wa- wanted to talk about testosterone because this is a big a big thing that comes up for a lot of guys is, well, how's my testosterone? You get there's these commercials that are on um, and you have these things about being tired or, um, you know, having a low sex drive, and, and maybe it's testosterone related. And I just want to start with what is low T, and how common is it? And um, you know, is it really as the, as the TV say, or um, you know, if we could just talk about that a little bit. Sure. So, body makes testosterone, specifically the testicles, and it makes it in a rhythmic fashion, meaning that. Uh, testicles secrete testosterone, not constantly, but the level of production goes up and down with circadian rhythms over the course of the day, and testosterone production kind of hits into high gear uh, around uh, age 12 or 13, around puberty, and that gives uh, boys the, the hormone boost in order to get the secondary sex characteristics, and uh, testosterone levels are high, and we know studies that as men get older, the testosterone levels drop probably in the late 20s, early 30s is when they start dropping. And they drop in in some men very, very slowly and other men more significantly, depending on what other conditions, you know, going on uh, with their body. So we know that that we expect to see a decrease in testosterone as men get older. And the term for that has been affectionately coined andropause. So just as women go into menopause, There's a belief that men, after they hit a certain midlife stage, and there's no specific age, that the testosterone becomes so low that it causes symptoms. Um, So the issue really isn't low T as measured as a number because it's just a number. I think the issue is is somebody having symptoms of hypogonadism. So in, in my profession, we, we call men with low testosterone and the symptoms of low testosterone, but we refer to that as, as hypogonadism or those men as hypogonadal, meaning that their testicles and secreting as much testosterone um, to support their, their normal function. So I believe it's a reasonably common problem. Um, and let me outline what these symptoms are, and uh, I think they'll resonate with a lot of men in the Middle Ages. So the feeling of tiredness at the end of the day or in the late afternoon uh, when testosterone levels are at their lowest. Testosterone levels are highest in the morning, the early morning, and lowest in the mid-late afternoon. So 
you have a big lunch, you go back to the office, and then by 4 or 5 o'clock, you're ready to kind of take a nap. So part of it is diet, but part of it also might be low testosterone. So lack of energy, lack of sex drive. Um, sometimes erectile dysfunction goes along with this. Um, lack of mental acuity, memory loss. In some men, it's significant enough to cause depression. And I've actually seen men who were treated for years with antidepressants, and they came to see me, and we found out it was actually their testosterone that was very low, and that's why they had the symptoms of depression. And when you replace their testosterone, the depression goes away, and they can go off the, the Wellbutrin and the, you know, the Prozac and that stuff. Um, so those are really the main, main symptoms. Uh, the other physical symptoms uh, or physical, physical signs are, you know, the love handles around uh, the spare tire, the belly, of a decrease in, in muscle mass, upper body muscle mass, and increase in, in, in gut size. Those are also related to low testosterone. Of course, it can also be related to poor diet and exercise. And at the end of the day, everything's kind of interrelated because exercise actually raises testosterone levels, and there are certain foods that are better or worse for, uh, for men as they get older and their metabolism changes. So I do think that it's a fairly common thing as men get into their 40s, 50s, 60s. It's not something that, like women, uh, it's um, a for sure thing. Uh, I know men in their 70s and 80s who are very vigorous and have never – had any issue and you measure their testosterone levels and, and uh, they're actually pretty good in, in the, in the mid-range. But for a lot of men, their testosterone levels are going to drop uh, significantly as they uh, progress through, uh, through midlife. Okay. I don't have a specific statistic as to how many or what percentage of men uh, will go through this, but it's clearly a big enough business that, as you mentioned early on, there are commercials on TV targeting men with these symptoms. So it, it, it's certainly a multi-billion dollar business. So that means it's affecting a lot of people. A lot of men are yeah. symptomatic. So you say that this is primarily it's, it's in guys that are, that are um, getting a little bit older. Um, if these are, you know, if you're thinking about becoming a dad when you're older, is this something you need to worry about? It, it, it's made in the testicle. Does that impact your body's ability to, to be fertile? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's a great question for two reasons. So the first reason is, as you said, it's made in the testicle, and the testicle only has two jobs. It makes sperm and it makes testosterone. So certainly it would be logical to assume that if the testicle is not making enough of, of, of testosterone, might it also be not making a whole heck of a lot of sperm. And we know also that sperm counts drop as men get older. And they probably drop correspondent to the, the testosterone to some degree. Um, but there's so much redundancy and excess capacity in terms of sperm production that, you know, uh, an 18 or 19 or 20-year-old might have a sperm count of 100 or 200 million, whereas maybe a 40 or 50-year-old may have a sperm count of 15 or 20 million, which you know, might be a fifth or a tenth of what it was when they were younger, but it still might be perfectly fine to get the job done in terms of fertility. The bigger thing about low testosterone aging and fertility is, and I think this is what you're alluding to, the treatment of low testosterone can make men infertile. And very few doctors and very few potential patients are aware of this, that when a man goes in, and he complains to his internist or, or he goes to one of these anti-aging clinics, he complains and says, you know what, I'm having all these symptoms, and they measure his testosterone, and it might not even be low. It might be just in the low end of normal, and they start him on testosterone, whether it's via a gel or a cream or a patch or a shot. They don't typically tell men that once they start on the testosterone, two things happen. Number one is that it actually stops sperm production. It shuts down the testicle. So when somebody starts on exogenous testosterone, meaning taken from the outside, their testicle or their, their body senses that they have lots of testosterone, and therefore 
their testicle doesn't get the signal to make testosterone, but it also doesn't get the signal to make sperm. So it's very, very, very common that when a man starts taking testosterone, he becomes sterile. Yeah, that's, a, that's some big news. If you're trying to start a family, you uh, absolutely you, you could get that big blow of, hey, I got low T, you go in, you try to get some T, and now you get back from your semen analysis and you're shooting blanks. That's um, and it's it's not exactly. necessarily your body, but it is the fact that you're you're messing up the signals that would make your testicle norm function normally. Absolutely, and for a lot of guys, you know, they're not told that uh, that it makes them sterile. The typical uh, patient that I see who comes in with this situation, I may see one or two of them a week. Is yeah, I wasn't feeling so great. I went to my doctor. And he told me it might lower my sperm count a little bit, but he didn't say it was going to make me sterile. Um, You know, and then they go back to the doctor and like, wow, that can't happen. Never seen that. It happens all the time. So the other thing that they don't get told is that there is a possibility once they start taking testosterone, they're on it for life, that they may uh, not be able to come off the testosterone. And that's another kind of thing that we don't want to use this cavalierly, especially in someone who's 40 or 45 or 50 and may be alive for another 40 years, that you might be committing them to lifelong hormonal therapy. And if you're a younger on the younger end with a low or, or, or low T and you start taking the testosterone and then you, you find that you're um, not producing any sperm, that's, is it reversible or is that it? that there's nothing so that for, can be done after that. Yeah. So for most men, it's reversible. It is. But okay. There is so, a, that's, but there, that's, so that's a good thing. But there is a small group of men where it's not reversible. So that's number one, probably in the 10% range. It's not reversible, but it also depends how they've been on the testosterone and how long they've been on it. So the way the testosterone is supplemented, the route of administration of the medicine has an impact on how long it takes to recover sperm. So when men take shots once a month, what ends up happening is the testosterone that they get spikes, and then after three to five days, it starts dropping. Then it drops down, and their body turns on. The hypothalamus and their pituitary kick in, so there's a little bit of signal probably going down to the testicle. And then they take their next shot three or four weeks later, um, and, you know, kind of goes up again. So, so to speak, their their testicles get a little drink of, of, the, of, of the stimulatory hormones. When somebody takes something like pellets or when somebody takes a daily cream or a daily gel or a daily patch, they're getting suppressed every single day completely. So the testicle doesn't wow. get that intermittent uh, refresher, if you will, of, of hormones, uh, stimulatory hormones. So it takes much, much longer for the testicle to actually come back and make sperm when someone's been completely suppressed, and especially when it's, it's been going on for years as opposed to three or four or five or six months. So, Doctor, why would, uh, um, how come a patient would get it via a shot or the gel or the pellets? What, what, what's the criteria for that? Just the specific doctor who's prescribing it? So I think so a couple of things. One is, yeah, one is a specific doctor. So uh, some doctors sell the shots out of their office, so it's a money maker for them, um, as opposed to giving them a prescription and going to the pharmacy and getting a gel or a patch or a cream. But, of course, for fertility, being on the shots is better than being on the other stuff in terms of restoring fertility. Just keep that in right. mind. But, yeah, uh, I know there are a lot of clinics sell, sell the actual injections. They mark them up significantly. So they want doctors, uh, they want patients to be on shots. The other thing is some uh, clinics make the patients actually come into the clinic uh, to sell them the stuff and give it to them. They won't actually write them a prescription and teach them how to do it. Um, Some patients would rather be on a cream or a gel than on a shot. It's easier for them to do at home. Sometimes it makes them feel better. Some patients say, you know what, they don't like being on the gel or the cream. The patch sometimes gives a rash, and they got to move it to different spots. So it's a bit of a pain in the rear end. Um, whereas the shot's sort of a once, uh, once every couple of weeks, once every month thing, and they can just take it and then forget it for the rest of the month. And they're on autopilot. So there's pros and cons to each. At the end of the day, I think it should be patient choice. 
whatever whatever makes the patient feel the best, then uh, then that's what they should go with. And it's a bit of trial and error to find out what makes them, you know, feel most right. normal. So this brings up an interesting point. I'm just thinking about testosterone and athletic performance. You know, the, the big side effect of testosterone is that it, it helps increase your muscle mass. And, um, you know, the, in younger men, there's all kinds of things that uh, they will uh, explore to help, you know, with their athletic performance. And maybe we could talk a little bit about, one, uh, these older guys, are, are they getting levels of, t of T or can they get levels of T that are really, you know, going to take them to the gym and really help things out there? Um, and B, for these younger guys um, who, you know, have used things, which things are bad, which things are good, um, you, you know, there's, there's quite a few different supplements. So maybe we could just talk about a little bit about, about that. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, there are... Uh, certainly a segment of guys who are very um, body conscious and, and image aware and they want to look good and they want to feel good. Certainly uh, guys, um, I see a population of divorced men, you know, and they have to get back in the dating world. So they want to kind of get into the gym and get buffed up and they want to do it quickly. Um, see a bunch of CEOs that want to stay on top of their game. So yeah, performance enhancing uh, properties of the testosterone are very appealing to both young men in the athletic realm and uh, to older men in the realm of business or uh, in the social scene. Um, I'm not a huge fan of prescribing testosterone for the image enhancing and the performance enhancing aspects of it. They come as a, as a potential bonus. You know, certainly there's no reason, in my opinion, from a medical standpoint, that normal, healthy adolescents or young men uh, should be on testosterone. And, of course, it is... Uh, outlawed by all professional sports organizations, you know, uh, officially people, you know, sneak around. That's one thing. But at least I know the the uh, NHL and the NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball all have banned uh, steroid use. And not only have they banned testosterone, I know they've banned uh, stuff like HCG and Clomid because it's performance enhancing, potentially. So do those HCG and Clomid, do those impact your fertility in the same way that testosterone or steroids would? No, so uh, they don't. They are medicines we actually use sometimes to enhance fertility. And the reason they don't is because HCG and Clomid actually stimulate the testicle as opposed to suppress the testicle. And because they have a stimulatory effect, meaning that they cause the body to make its own testosterone as opposed to the other stuff where you just take doses of testosterone from the outside. Because they cause the testicle to work better on its own, they actually have the potential benefit of improving fertility. So if you're and that's, that's the medicine. Of... Right. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, if, if you're a guy thinking about fatherhood, then these kinds of medications might be more useful for treating low T symptoms or for, you know, helping oh, the body help itself. Absolutely. And we commonly use uh, these medicines in hypogonadal men who are interested in fertility for exactly that reason, because you take care of both problems uh, with one medication. So you don't have to have a choice. It's not like, well, treat my low T or try to start a family. You can. No, of course not treat your low T and and improve your sperm production through potentially through medication. Yeah, so that that's true for most people. There is a subpopulation of men who really have testicular failure. And uh we try they've been on testosterone for a while but they want to have a family and we have to get them off the testosterone for at least 6 months in order to the azeal spermic from before the testosterone because they had other issues. And we have to get them off the testosterone and put them on some of these other stimulatory medicines for six months. And sometimes it doesn't have the same effect as the testosterone. It gets their testosterone up somewhat, but not as high as where they were on the testosterone. And therefore, they don't feel quite as good. But that's a very small segment of, of the population. So how would you... So, so to, oh, go ahead, Kristen. So I, w I wanted to circle back to what you said at the beginning, which was so um, so important, I think, that um, uh, when you were rattling off what 
uh, symptoms there were for low T, right? So that you were saying, you know, lack of energy, lack of sex drive, you know, um, uh, weight gain around the middle. It's, I, you were talking about uh, old, the older uh, gentleman about this. And then you said about poor diet and exercise, you know, and how they're all interconnected. And so what, what, Sarah and I, and what we talked about last year and what we're, we're so hoping to bring this conversation around to is the wholeness of the body, right? So how, when someone comes into your office, doctor, and, and you, you see someone in that age group or someone younger who, you know, is, is showing the symptoms of maybe a rounder belly and, and talking about these things before I, they should be coming to you, maybe not necessarily their primary care physician, because isn't that one of, like, in your mental checklist when you look at this person coming in that you're like, okay, if we, we talk about diet and, and lifestyle changes, that would improve the situation also? Yes, that's a very good point. So the symptoms of low testosterone are also the symptoms of being a couch potato. Right. I don't mean that sort of sarcastically. I mean someone who has poor diet and poor exercise habits and doesn't sleep well, or they're the symptoms of someone who's under a lot of stress, you know, right. family, job, uh, all those things. So stress is like one of the big killers of libido and certainly makes people feel really tired. It makes them sleep poorly. Um, a poor diet does similar uh, in that, uh, you know, eating a lot of carbs, you get that insulin spike, and then you kind of, you know, get really tired a couple hours after a big, uh, big carb diet. Um, so you're right. You know, just because someone has these symptoms doesn't mean it's because they have low testosterone. It could also be that they have other, these other issues going on in their life, and probably that's a lot more common than low testosterone is people on poor diets and, and not exercising and having stress and, and, uh, and poor sleep habits. So if you see a guy who's, you know, has the symptoms and, you know, you, you counsel him like this kind of a lifelong thing, if you're going to go under hormonal treatment, um, do you see, do, do you see guys that are, okay, we're going to try to do this naturally or try to increase things naturally. Do you see, Men who, you know, really take it seriously, do you see them be able yeah. to improve things? Yeah, some do. So, I mean, if I see somebody who comes in and their body mass index is on the higher side, you know, they say, oh, I put on 20, 30 pounds in the last couple of years. I had all the stress, so on and so forth. And their testosterone might be a little low. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have them go on a diet and get into shape and get to the gym. So, as I mentioned before, Exercise does increase testosterone levels, and losing weight and having a lower BMI, you know, testosterone gets converted to estrogen in, in fat cells of the body. So the more fat cells you have, the more estrogen, uh, the more the more aromatase that's around. Uh, the aromatase is the enzyme that takes testosterone and breaks it down into estrogen, which means it lowers testosterone levels and increases estrogen levels. So that can give men that kind of gynecoid appearance, you know, uh, a breast instead of pecs and a big gut and hips and all that. So if you lose weight, get rid of those uh, fat cells, shrink them down, and uh, exercise, you're bound to increase uh, testosterone. And also being on a better diet gives you more energy. Exercise gives you more energy, makes you feel better. And that actually might do much better than actually getting on testosterone. Testosterone may be an adjunct in small doses for a short period of time to help people, you know, um, act as a catalyst to help them get back into uh, into their uh, into their healthy lifestyle. But certainly, it would be uh, optimal uh, for the people with these kind of symptoms and in this situation to do it naturally as opposed to uh, through uh, pharmacology. And how does that transfer that, into... It, go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> We're I was just going to ask, how does that transfer into, into, you know, into the bedroom and into fertility? Well, the problem is, is that it's a slow process, and you've got to be really motivated, right? So... I have a uh, a close friend and, and uh, uh, exercise and diet guru who uh, I work with, 
His name's Harley Pasternak. He's a best-selling author, and he uh, he really knows his stuff when it comes to when it comes to this. And uh, he will sometimes take those patients, and he'll give them an exercise routine, and I'll give them a diet, and he'll get them into shape, and then they'll shred weight, and they'll feel better, and they'll be more virile, and uh, they'll feel better about themselves, which will make them more appealing both to themselves and their partner. And so it's 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 uh it's a, a spiral in a positive way. One thing feeds upon yeah, it another, like you know, a win, win, breeds... win for for a guy. <laughs> right. Success breeds success. Right. And and what about alcohol and smoking? Now what is the correlation between you know, we're talking about diet, but is there a correlation? What do you ask? Because to... I'm sitting a martini and smoking a stogie. As we speak. Are you really? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, I don't, that's I don't... why you didn't do a Google <laughs> Hangout because you were smoking yeah. and drinking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I only wish. There's no such luck. <laughs> no. No, I was wondering about the. You know, we're talking about fertility, and it's it's so powerful to bring awareness because I had a client who actually was shocked when I said, well, you know, you should be in moderation for alcohol consumption and talk to your doctor about that. And, you know, the statistics about that and, and you know, some people's moderation, they're very, other people's moderation. You know? so, yeah, moderation is one of those words that is very, very subjective. Right. Well, and, smoking is bad. No matter how you slice it, nothing good comes out of smoking for fertility or any other health-related uh, issue. So I recommend that everybody quit smoking. Uh, so that, that that really shouldn't even be, you know, zero, zero cigarettes. I guess if you're a social smoker and you go out once in a blue moon and bum a cigarette at a bar, you know, that's not the worst thing in the world. But but in general, smoking, uh, there's no, no good level of smoking. On the other hand, alcohol, I mean, I think if you drink, a few drinks a week and you come home and you want to enjoy a glass of wine and there's certainly benefits to red wine on the health perspective standpoint um and it's a it's a nice stressor and it, and and uh it's it's a social mixer i don't think there's any problem with a little bit of alcohol and if you want to talk about quantities i tell patients less than five to seven a week so whether they drink you know, one every other day or one one glass of wine at night, whether they have a couple of, uh, 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 you know, three or four on a weekend, however you want to slice it, but keep it under five to seven per week, you're probably doing okay. So, um, do you know, I'm just kind of curious about, you know, smoking, if you're quitting smoking, you know, a lot of people turn to e-cigarettes as a new kind of way to support that. Is there any evidence uh, one way or the other about the effect of e-cigarettes and on and vapes on on fertility i haven't seen anything yet doesn't mean it, that doesn't exist but i don't think there's enough evidence or enough data on e-cigarettes and in general health and enough studies you know so i'm not sure that anybody's looked into e-cigarettes and fertility but at the end of the day i think the issue is toxin generation free radical peroxidation and free radical generation which occurs when you burn a hydrocarbon uh organic material plant matter um, i don't think that's the way the e-cigarette works it's just vapor it's just heating water so i don't think that uh, just knowing the mechanism that it operates that it, it should cause lots of free radicals in the body I don't know what, so what would happen. You so know, for, a lot of people have now, flavor. It's probably at least, at least at least a, a uh, an option for people who are, um, you know, heavy smokers as, as one way to. Oh yeah. You know, I can't start imagine the process. that it's as bad as smoking. Because um, all it really does is heat up water vapor, and they add a little bit of uh, a flavoring into it. I don't know what happens when you heat the flavoring on a biochemical, you know, basis. What it does to the body, or in the body. But uh, but just heated water vapor shouldn't do a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, it would be. It's an interesting area, I think, of research, and I'm sure there's got to be people working on figuring that out. They're relatively new, so it wouldn't be enough time to have done deep studies. But uh, yep, yeah, interesting. Um, 
You know, one other question I I made me come to my mind uh, about fertility and testosterone is I remember one time we discussed a case of varicocele and um, that actually impinging on testosterone production. And so I just wanted to circle around about that because a lot of men get varicoceles. They get diagnosed with them as part of what's contributing to fertility. Um, I think it's maybe less talked about, or at least I don't see it as often as linked to testosterone production. So I'd love to hear your comments. Does it is it common, or um, can it can a varicocele impact testosterone? Yeah, for sure. I absolutely think so. Varicocele, which is a varicose vein um, that drains the testicle, uh, can impair both sperm production and uh, testosterone production. And there have been a number of studies that show that in men who have low testosterone, if you fix their varicocele, there's a very good chance that their testosterone production is actually going to go back up into the normal range. So... I think there is an association. I think that for men who have varicoceles, perhaps they become symptomatically hypogonadal earlier, meaning instead of maybe 50s or 60s, if you have a big varicocele, maybe it might happen in, in, in the late 30s or 40s. It might. Uh, again, there's so many factors that go into it from a genetic standpoint, and that's, I think, why some men of varicocele causes uh, significant damage, uh, and another man uh, uh, the same size or bigger varicocele causes less damage. I think it has to do with biochemistry and their genetic makeup. So, if you're if you're experiencing hypogonadal symptoms and you have a varicocele, it's at least worth exploring with your doctor about yeah. the repair compared to fertility treatments, uh, or you know, like Clomid, or you know, maybe doing both in tandem or Sure, because it may fix your problem. And then if it fixes your problem, you don't have to commit to lifelong steroid therapy, which I think at the end of the day is much healthier to fix your varicocele. It's much cheaper. When you think about it, these medications are very expensive. Few of them are covered by insurance, and you've got to take it for the rest of your life. So fixing something, there's a, a bigger upfront cost, but then if it works, that's it. You paid it, and, and uh, it's not a recurring cost. Uh, every month uh, for the rest of your life, much more cost effective. So one more question. That's is what you, I can't you... figure out. Insurance companies should be dying to cover varicocele repairs, which they typically don't. And the reason they should is because it's going to keep the men off the testosterone in later years. It's and much more cost effective for them. Can so, you say that again? What, what have cover. you noticed that? Can you say that again? I didn't. I, I, you broke out a little bit. So what did you say that they were, that you've noticed that they're, I'm just going to be quiet and let you say it again. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure which point you were. That, that if you go in and have the varicocele uh, checked out and have the the reversal or the surgery for that, um, that, that will also, of course, what you're talking about, um, uh, improve the the T your your low T you yeah. know that down the road yeah. that you will not have to take this lifetime pill, and mm-hmm. I think I think for me what what just I love listening to this conversation because I I told Sarah about this the other day I was grocery shopping and I was talking to the the woman behind the the deli counter and I was getting cheese for my kids and and this young kid started talking you know he was about 30 or something and saying that oh well i don't have my kids are i can't talk about my kids they're not here yet i'm actually going to wait until i get married till i'm 40 or 45 and marry a younger woman and i'm not going to have to worry about my fertility and well that may be I true was, or may not be. <laughs> i know that's what i said to him i said um I, so he you know of course you you know the you know people in the store because you go there regularly and I'm like, honey, that's not necessarily true. I said, you know, how old are you? And and I'm like, are you getting, you know, are you going to your primary care? Have you had, you know, a physical? And, you know, I was talking to him all this. He goes, well, you don't understand what I said. It doesn't, it's not going to matter because I'm going to marry a younger wife. And I'm like, and then, like, it was like watching tennis because the people waiting in line were kind of looking at me. I'm like, no, I didn't. I, I completely understood what you said. That's not true. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> I, and I'm like, you know, you don't know what I do for a living, but you need to look into your own body. It's not just 
it just takes two, you know? And so I think it's just bringing the awareness of what you said that in a plus empowering men to have know the choices, right? Because I think yeah. for a man, I'm not a man. I can't talk to how you might feel or how they might feel. But hearing that you have low testosterone and feeling lousy and then just thinking, okay, let me pop the pill and then it's going to be fine. Until you said it loud and clear, doctor, that this is a lifetime commitment. Forever. <laughs> Once they start that. It's, it's, um, it's so important to drive that point home. Sure. And, absolutely. And, yeah. So, oh, absolutely. I'm sorry I interrupted, but it was very whatever you know. We, I, I, I just think that it's so important to know the. No, thank you for highlighting your plan. It. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Look, yeah. I, I, the, I, I the number agree. one thing is people, choice. Yeah. People it's have choice. to know what their yeah. options are, and if they don't know, right. if they're not educated to what their options are, they can't, you know, necessarily make informed good decisions. But and you know, the unless you do choices. a lot of research on, yeah, unless you do a lot of research on your own, you know, uh, and most people don't have the time to do it. You just kind of listen to what the doctor says, and if the doctor doesn't know himself or herself, then uh, then that becomes a big problem, and that's the problem we're seeing. So, doctor, you said you know some guys they don't recover. Uh, or they, you know, they experience what's known as testicular failure, which means that they don't, they kind of, they're just kind of, they shoot blanks and that's it. Is that the end, is that, is that it for their path to biological father? Or is there, um, are there other tricks or other things that you, uh, being such an incredible expert at this, can help in those cases? Oh, you, you, you flatter me too much. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, you're a miracle maker. <laughs> God's a miracle maker. I just, I just do work. But um, yeah, uh, so there is a treatment um, for men who are, as your first shooting blanks, or uh, the medical order, the azospermic, uh, because of poor testosterone, or because I'm sorry, poor sperm production for one reason or another, and there's a variety of reasons why someone would not have sperm out in the ejaculate from a production uh, standpoint as opposed to a, a blockage of the reproductive plumbing, which is a whole separate issue. Um, and these are challenging cases, but between a combination of hormone therapy and microsurgery, the vast majority of men who have non-obstructive azospermia and uh, I'm not sure you classify them all as, as having testicular failure, but on their way to testicular failure, uh, they, they seem to have small pockets of sperm production uh, within the testicle, something like up to 70% of men with uh, with sperm production problems, such that they don't have enough sperm to be seen in the ejaculate. The vast majority of them will have sperm uh, produced in the testicle. As a matter of fact, one of my colleagues in New York just published a paper where even in the worst cases where the men have a condition called Sertoli cell only syndrome where there's um, not even the precursor cells to become sperm on a routine biopsy. And I believe in his study, up to 40% of, of those men, he was able to find small amounts of sperm in the testicle. And that's huge. And what that does is, is, is a big thing. And this is the, the message I would love to get out to the urology community in general and to, uh, to men who have these problems. When I trained, and what's going on in most of the urology world is when someone doesn't have any sperm in the ejaculate, they do a biopsy of the testicle as a diagnostic procedure to see if there's any sperm, and I take one or two little pieces. They send it off to the pathologist, and if there's sperm, they're great, and if there isn't, there isn't. Everything has changed or should change in that there's no reason to do these procedures anymore because most men are going to have sperm found if you go in and do this microsurgically, you don't have to do this as a diagnostic procedure and send the specimen off to the pathologist. What we can do is we can do this either at the time of an IVF cycle, a day or two before, and take the sperm and use them, or we can do this way in advance of an IVF cycle, take the sperm and freeze them. When you send it to the pathologist, they kill the sperm. That's it. Then if they find something, you have to come back and have another operation to go get more. 
So the big take-home message, and I don't know if this is what was made clear at the AUA, is there's no reason anymore to do diagnostic procedures on men with non-obstructive azospermia. That means you don't have to go do diagnostic biopsies. It means you don't have to do testicular mapping. It means all you have to do is the microtessy, either in advance of the IVF or with the IVF, uh, and take the sperm and either freeze them or use them. And that's a big thing because it saves men an extra operation, huge amount of cost, right? Uh, two recoveries, downtime from work. I mean, it's a big thing. So the conclusion was that diagnostic procedures, again, whether it's a fine needle biopsy or an open biopsy or a, a testicular mapping procedure, these things should become things of the past because they're no longer necessary given the very high likelihood of finding sperm and given the ability for us to go. And if we find it, to freeze it, so that right. then it can be used with IVF. There was a study that was published by uh, Craig Neideberger, one of my colleagues uh, at, uh, in Chicago at the University of Illinois, and he found that sperm taken from these men, the pregnancy rate, whether the sperm was used fresh or whether it was used frozen, was exactly the same. It was a little over 50%. So there's really no reason to not be doing this in advance as one procedure and get rid of all this diagnostic stuff. That that's amazing, isn't it? It it it's I feel like I've been around in this quote unquote industry for so long that just hearing you say that is just so uh such a blessing and it is a miracle. I know that you It is. You you know, you shun that away from you what you do, but that's a miracle. That is going to create a miracle. The fact that you just said pockets of sperm it's not like binders of women, but it's pocket, pockets of sperm that that you're basically taking a step away from um, something that's so traumatic to a couple and so hopeful. Now you just it, it, with this technology or this this new study that's profound. That's so tweetable. Tweet tweet that boy. Um, yeah. So thank so you for that. The big thing is <laughs> sure. How how do we get the general urologist and the other doctors, the few of them in my industry, from from continuing to do diagnostic procedures, get them to stop doing this well, stuff. Well, I and even I mean, even a, a bigger step back from that. I mean, some guys they get diagnosed with the spermia and they say that's it. You you don't that's it. you they walk you away. have to use yes. donor sperm. That's it. Yeah. You don't have oh, any choice it. at fatherhood. That's that, that luckily has gotten better with uh, with the awareness of IVF. But when I first started, that really was kind of the party line is, okay, that's the end of the road, you know, uh, go ahead and, uh, and and use donor sperm. And I still once in a blue moon will hear it, especially from somebody who goes to an older urologist and gets their opinion, and they don't know about, uh, you know, about the potential for using testicular sperm or in more rural areas as opposed to, a, you know, a city like L.A. or New York where many more of the doctors are up to speed, and at least they know it's possible. And, look, they may still do biopsies and vasograms, which, you know, should really be things of the past and selectively used. Um, that, uh, you know, it's just it's, it's education. But uh, Yeah, I mean, this comes uh, back to your go original ahead. message of knowing your option and, and being your own choice health advocate. Yeah, advocate, yeah. Yeah, Testoc you know, testicular sperm. That's the that's the word you just used. So that's testicular the, sperm. You know, yeah. But, okay, that's what the that's the terminology that that needs to be out there, and that you need to be able to ask that question. What about that? That's right. So and also, do I need to have a procedure to find out if it's there first, or can I just go ahead and get it? You know. Um, right. Go get it. So, so <laughs> the, the takeaway is, you know, get a second opinion. If you have low T and you need, you know, you, you you're dealing with issues, you know, get your get your choices, get your learn about it, understand what's causing it, make sure that it makes sense to you. If you if you have low sperm production or you have no sperm, find out what's going on. Get informed about your options. Um, and, and, you know, get a second opinion uh, so you can be your own, you know, your own advocate. Because sometimes these things are expensive. Sometimes these things are, are worth it. Sometimes the chances are great. Sometimes they're not so great. 
Um, but, you know, right. you don't make a lot of misery. Right. Exactly. And it's about staying open because I, I had amazing, you know, couples and, and men as clients that once they got that diagnosis, they closed. They just closed down. No, they're not mm-hmm. even going to try. They're done. They're done. But that that is so empowering to know just what the terminology just you said, what you just spoke about so eloquently. And, you know, there is there's always a, another person to speak to about this and get mm-hmm. as much information that you need. So that's so powerful. Well, Stay awareness open. and education are always, always key to any of this. And, and that really, and again, I don't know whether that was a big take-home point uh, at the AUA, but it really should be because, the, you know, the conclusions from uh, from these studies are, are, are really glaring that diagnostic procedures should no longer be performed. I mean, it, it just said it in black and white, and it makes sense. So I hope that the guys who are out there who are doing the diagnostic procedures uh, really kind of do a turnaround and uh, an evaluation and, and say, hey, we don't need to be doing this to people anymore. It, it causes more harm than good and waste more resources than necessary. That's Yeah, I that's mean, it the, could also probably be, um, you know, heartbreaking if you get a, a positive on the on the diagnosis, but they don't find it the well, second time. Well, that unfortunately when they go also happens. And that's the problem with mapping, is that when they do the mapping and they put little needles uh, to different areas of the testicle and they aspirate and they make a cytology slide, they fix the sperm and they kill it. And they may find a few, and I've seen a number of patients who've had the mapping procedure have come in because they went back in, you know, to follow the map and then couldn't find any usable sperm. Sperm weren't moving, they weren't alive, and the mapping doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the sperm. It just says maybe there are a few there and where they might be. But uh, there's more to it than just uh, a a few sperm. Uh, Number one. Number two, as you said, it's possible that you find a sperm or two on the map and you go in for the procedure and thinking that there's a 100% chance you're going to get sperm and there's nothing there when you go in, and, and uh, that, that can be devastating. That's why I say just do it once, get what you need. That's a great, um, great feedback. I think this has been just a really informative uh, discussion about, one, testosterone throughout the life. I mean, really, we're talking about we we talked about it at the kind of adolescence and young 20s as an athletic performance thing all the way through into your later life where you have these andropausal issues and that, you know, testosterone is critical for life quality, but it's also critical for sperm production. And, and then also, you know, this discussion about um, really being in charge of your reproductive health and getting second opinions um, when you're talking to your physician um, to really know what your options are and what's the right way for, for your situation. And, and the take, if you, and if you begin the testosterone, that's a lifetime uh, of, of doing that, that, you know, you need to not only have these multiple conversations, but really, you know, investigate that down the road. I, I, it's, you know, when you said that, doctor, it feels to me like having to be on birth control for the rest of your life, right? That you have to take a pill mm-hmm. every day, and what does that do to your body? You know, the long-term effects. So that's so so tweetable too. So thank you so sure. much. I look the forward to our oh, time. Oh, okay, okay, go ahead. One, one more. One go last ahead. thing. Some people ask me, do you think testosterone is good or testosterone is bad? And the answer is testosterone isn't good and it isn't bad. What it is is applying testosterone is a hormone. It's a chemical. It's made by the body. It's necessary for the body. What it is is the use of testosterone and what situation you're using it. Is that good or that bad? So it's not testosterone itself that's good or bad, as a lot of people kind of think, oh, they hear testosterone, oh, that's bad, or testosterone, wow, that's great, I need a lot of it. It, 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 it How you use it and who you use it in. Right. That's awesome. And not everybody's in the same situation. Many times I'll see patients and I'll take care of them, and they have one problem, and they'll send a whole bunch of their buddies, and their buddies have completely different situations. Well, you you know, that's what you did for my friend, so that's what I want. But your situation isn't the same as as his. 
So everybody has to be treated by as an individual, and that's one of the problems with these commercials. Is the commercials throw out a wide net, hoping to catch as many fish as possible. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's not one size fit all, is it? It's not, it's not a one, one size, size fit, fit all. all. Exactly. That's it. I think that's exactly. a big, that's a good tweet. Everybody's yeah, body one, is their own. Yeah. I'm trying to be tweetable for you. Yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> you are very tweetable. <laughs> My wife never tells me that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to our... Great talking our, to you. Our hour, an hour a year. I look forward to it for next year. In the meantime... Me too. If... If um, if anyone needs to find you, of course, all your information is up on the website. But is there a uh, um, the, what is the easiest way for someone to get a hold of you or or call uh, my come office. in and see you? Okay, yeah, just call my wanna... office. Leave me a message. Three one zero two seven seven two eight seven three, and uh, call. Leave me a message, and I'll get back to you. If, if okay. there's any guys out there who are who are um, you know, struggling with either low T or sperm production issues and just want a second opinion. Um, Dr. Worthman is just an incredible, uh, easy going. He'll hear, he'll hear you out and he'll um, really give you some straight feedback. So I would, I would encourage you to reach out to, reach out to him. Thank you. We also do phone consultations and Skype consultations. So we can talk to anybody anywhere in the world. Make it easy for the men. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for joining us again, for making dads. And we're so we're so honored and uh, appreciative. So thank you so much. And I'll appreciate it. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.